A new coronavirus subvariant is creating concern in the United States as two other respiratory illnesses are keeping hospitals busy. And later in the show, we ask the question, is the West politicizing COVID in China? Hello, I'm Arnold Knight, and this is The Heat. Last month, two respiratory viruses, RSV and influenza, drove hospitalization rates to the highest level in more than a decade in the United States. Meantime, a new coronavirus subvariant has emerged and is rapidly spreading across the country. Public officials are concerned about this triple demic and how it will add stress to an already overloaded healthcare system. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. William Hasseltine about what can be done to stop the spread of this new variant. And I started by asking him about the concept of herd immunity. Herd immunity doesn't exist uh, for this virus any more than it does for influenza. Herd immunity has always been a fallacy. I pointed that out very early on. Those who relied on herd immunity had very high infection rates and very high death rates. It's a, uh, it was a, a terrible concept to introduce, and it, should, it does not apply to these types of viruses. Can the current crop of vaccines counter the variants that are emerging? Well, very poorly. Uh, they protect very poorly. Um, the, even the uh, new uh, bivalent Omicron-specific vaccines protect very poorly against these new variants, XBB and, and, and others. Um, they do have some effect on reducing hospitalization and death. And that effect seems to be longer than their ability to protect from any sort of infection. But the, the vaccines are not very effective in preventing uh, infection, and very, uh, although they're a little bit infect, uh, effective in preventing hospitalizations and death or reducing them. There will still be further infections, and there will still be further hospitalizations and further deaths from this virus. Uh, I think the only way we are going to put this back in the bottle is to uh, develop uh, highly effective antiviral drugs. None of the drugs we have today that we know prevent infection. We need drugs like the drugs we have for HIV that prevent infection. It's not an impossible task. Mm -hmm. I think it's ultimately, it's a very straightforward to do. You need to understand the virus in great detail, and then you can have the ability to develop drugs that stop specific parts of the virus. Not too hard to do, but it requires sustained investment and a lot of people working on exactly those problems. And I don't see that happening now anywhere. It's a mistake that was made around the world from the very beginning to think that either public health or vaccines would um, stop this. And you might remember, and then that from the very beginning, I said the same thing. To stop this infection, we need combinations of potent antiviral drugs to prevent those from getting infected and treat those who are infected. So then what do you attribute this reticence on the part of uh, drug companies, researchers, and scientists to develop antiviral drugs? I think it was based on false hope. False hope that is it would contain the infection, public health measures such as China implemented very effectively in the early days uh, would work and did not anticipate that the virus could change and become far more infectious to render those essentially useless. And the same thing for the vaccines. People hoped that the vaccines uh, would work. It was clear to me from the beginning that diseases like influenza uh, are not preventable by vaccines. They can be reduced somewhat by vaccines, but they can't be prevented. Uh, and I think it was just an underestimate of the viral foe. You know, we see a lot of reports uh, in the media these days which tell us that what has now happened with the COVID virus is that it's just become another cold virus or another flu virus. Is that true? Well, it's another virus, but it's more lethal. And I'll tell you what keeps me up at night and worries me. People underestimated the virus' ability to change and evade vaccines. They underestimated the ability to change to become far more infectious. And they are underestimating the ability of this virus to become far more virulent. Let me remind you, that SARS kills more than half of the people over 
60 that it infects. MERS killed virtually everybody over 60 that it infected. These viruses have the potential. They become far more lethal. There is a bromide around that says as the viruses progress, they become weaker. Not true. That's never been true of polio. It's never been true of smallpox. And I doubt that it's true of this virus. What this could happen is become far more lethal, more transmissible and more lethal. And that is the danger, to think of this as just something we're going to live with. We had better get our act together and develop the combinations of drugs we need to stop this before we get hit by a variant that's not only extremely highly transmissible, immune evasive, but much more lethal. That is in the cards. Can't say it will happen, but you say it can happen. And I even say it's likely to happen. William Hazeltine, thanks for joining us, sir. You're welcome. Sorry, the news isn't better. To talk more about this triple-demic threat, let's bring in our panel. From Boston, Yanir Bayam is president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. Kate Tulenko is founder and CEO of Corvus Health. She joins us from Alexandria in Virginia. And from New York City, Calvin Sun is an emergency medicine physician and author of the book, The Monsoon Diaries, A Doctor's Journey of Hope and Healing from the ER front lines to the far reaches of the world. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Yanir Bayam, let me start with you. There is a feeling, not just in the United States, but across the world, that the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic is over. That's behind us. But listening to Bill Hazeltine there tell us about what could be a more virulent strain that could emerge, uh, what could be an even bigger threat to us, what are your thoughts? I mean, how great are the risks? I, I, first of all, I think he's completely right that the evolutionary dynamics is not one of creating more mild variants. In fact, it is already shown that the virus can evolve to more uh, lethal uh, variants. And, and there's no reason uh, to assume that it won't in the future. But more than that, um, there is the long COVID consequences, which include um, both uh, debilitating symptoms, uh, but also organ damage that is causing death uh, uh, through heart attacks and strokes and other effects that has already been demonstrated uh, uh, through studies um, and the, the major news over the last recent time, last few months, is, is a doubling from about 25 papers to about 50 papers about immune system harm. Uh, and what we've seen, of course, around the world is a, 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 the, the normal diseases, the, quote, diseases that we're used to, are becoming much more um, pro, pro widespread, much more severe. And... and the, the reasonable explanation for this is actually just going back to the fact that the exposure uh, to COVID has undermined a lot of the immune system's effectiveness through killing and, and, and really um, uh, 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 undermining the T cells of the body, which originally was something that people thought would be a major uh, strength of the immune system for COVID, but is actually being harmed through direct infection and, and other effects of the disease on the immune system. So how does one counter that? Uh, I mean, is there any way to prevent the virus evolving into something more powerful? So what we've done is we've created currently a circumstance where this partial immunity of the population with allowing the virus to spread is just not working, right? So what we have to do is to take the actions that we can to prevent transmission. And up until fairly recently, people have said, though it's never really been true, that the only thing that we can do is do severe lockdowns. But in fact, we've demonstrated that there are multiple tools that we have, and we know what they are. But as an example, recently we published an analysis that shows that just by doing mass testing alone, not doing lockdowns, but just by doing mass testing, we can actually completely stop the transmission of the virus within weeks um, if we do it in, a, in, a, in an organized fashion so that we detect cases and we make sure that the cases that we have don't transmit. And that's 
a, a, a much smaller impact on society. It's a much smaller impact on the economy than what we're doing now. Kate Tilenko, we've been talking about the so-called triple-demic. That's, of course, COVID, as well as RSV, which uh, affects infants, and influenza. Um, now, how does that complicate efforts to counter COVID and its spread? It complicates it in a number of ways. One is that RSV actually can affect anyone, not just infants. And when people get COVID and influenza and RSV together, they tend to be more sick. Plus, with these three diseases circulating out there, more people are getting sick as well, and it's overloading hospitals. Another component is uh, over the last three years, many pediatric beds have been converted to adult beds. And so as a result, there really are no beds for sick children now, and that's a, a huge problem that we're seeing. And what kind of um, symptoms do we see in infants who have RSV? It's very similar to COVID? Well, there is some overlap, and uh, you know there are a couple of charts that are circulating out there of the you know the different symptoms. You know, COVID, you're more likely to lose your sense of smell. RSV, you're more likely to wheeze. Uh, you know, with flu, more likely to have body aches. But you can't make the diagnosis just on the symptoms. You have to be tested, and, and you can be tested for for all three of these. And so that's what we we recommend. And it's especially important for people who are high risk because if you test positive for influenza or for COVID, there are oral treatments that can be given to you outpatient to ensure that you, you don't get more uh, ill and that you don't need to be hospitalized. And also, uh, we're very happy that there's now a vaccine for pregnant women that they can get uh, while they're pregnant and it will protect their newborn uh, for the first few months of life from severe RSV infection. Calvin, uh Kate was talking a moment ago about the fact that pediatric beds are now being converted to beds for adults in uh, medical care centers like hospitals and places like that. What kind of pressure is, is this putting on uh, hospitals? I mean, according to the New York Times, influenza has driven up hospitalization rates to the highest level for, the, for this time of year in more than a decade. What are you seeing? I think there's been a pattern of underinvestment in uh, our healthcare system that's now coming to a head, oh, that has been coming to a head the last three years. We've been through this before. For the past three, five, 10, 15 years since I've been a resident or a medical student, flu season was always more dire than we give it credit for. And then we forget about it and then we recycle it every year. And then we had COVID and then we had flu and COVID and Omicron last year. And now we have a triple demic and the under investment of healthcare resources uh, is leading us to this point where, from this very same article that, um, and print publication you quote, New York Times has also focused on the lack of investment in pediatric care. With so many pediatric intensive care units have shut down the past couple of years because they just don't make money. They, they're not a, a money maker in, you know, in, in the eyes of the healthcare system, which is why we're in this position right now. Why there's a nursing strike that start that began today citywide in New York City in the middle of a triple demic, mm -hmm. and the, to no fault of their own, they're doing it because we've been understaffed and underpaid and overworked uh, and been doing this so for the last five, five, ten, fifteen years, screaming from the rooftops, and nothing much has been done in terms of investments. So you know, I, I think that we are a reactive society, so we, we have to see the writing on the wall before we change, and that's. You know, probably emblematic, emblematic of you know what we do is no, there's no glory in prevention, and that's why we do what we do. And Calvin, that nurses' strike that you talk about, 7,000 nurses uh, have gone on strike at two major uh, hospitals in New York. What impact is that having? I mean, we saw it coming for a while. They have been doing negotiations for a very long time. They've been making warnings. And it's a game of chess or arm wrestling where no sides are budging. And, you know, it's not surprising that we're in this position in the middle of a triple pandemic where we're already understaffed. A lot of us healthcare workers have moved on out of hospital care into more, you know, clinic or urgent care or even retiring early because of COVID. And as a result, they're not filling the gaps that are, are being made by all of us being burnt out or morally injured after COVID. Not, not much has changed in that regard. And therefore, when we go to work right now, uh, it, it's even much more difficult. But they're doing it for the right reasons. We agree with them, a lot of us. And it, it's just sad that we had to get to this point because, again, there's no glory in prevention. They didn't want to prevent anything. And only until 
the writings on the wall, when things get bad, do things actually change? Yanir Bayam, I want to talk about this uh, Omicron variant, which, of course, spreads faster. It's at the center of the triple-demic. And there was a researcher at Northeastern University who said that it's not a matter of if. This is going to be pretty big. Uh, what is your assessment? So first of all, it is very rapidly transmitting. It went within a few weeks uh, from basically nothing to 40 percent in the U.S. Uh, it's at 70 percent in the Northeast. Uh, and there are surges in hospitalizations that are coming along with it. So the, the, the way it, there are two reasons why it is so rapidly transmitting. One is that it is um, very immune evasive. It's more immune evasive than any of the previous variants. Um, and, and so much so, by the way, that there's an article that shows that um, it's basically as different from an immune system perspective uh, from the original variant as was SARS-1, right? And, and we know that SARS-1 was a very different, uh, had very different impact with 10% uh, death rates. And, and so this variant has the ability to be incredibly different from the original variant in many of its properties. But the most important one that we already know is that it is incredibly immune evasive. The second um, thing is that it binds very strongly to the ACE2 receptor, which is the way the virus gets into cells. And it's much, much more strongly binding. So that may also contribute to the rapidity of transmission. But independent of which is the way it does it, or what's the most important factor, uh, it's growing incredibly rapidly with respect to the BQ variants. And the BQ variants, of course, were rapid compared to the ones before. So it's been growing very rapidly, and, and, and it's quite um, uh, uh, a concern to see that hospitalizations are increasing as well uh, at the same time as it's growing. And we won't know, of course, we don't know until later uh, how severe it will be, but we shouldn't be waiting. Right. This is one of the main problems, as, as was just said. We're not focused on prevention. Uh, people are, there are now being instituted masks in schools, in schools in, in, in Massachusetts, in, in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan. Uh, but the only reason that this is being done is because things are incredibly bad. And we shouldn't be waiting until things are incredibly bad. We should be protecting people before they get sick, not after uh, when they're already sick. And, and in fact, the whole shift to masking now is coming in the aftermath right. of, of giving up on, on actions. Yeah. Uh, and that really shows how bad it is. Kate, I was saying earlier on that we may perhaps have been lulled into a false sense of security about COVID, thinking that the worst is behind us. And part of that belief may be reinforced by the fact that, you know, a lot of people have been vaccinated, they've had their two shots, and a lot of people have got the booster shots as well. But are they all going to be effective against these new variants that are emerging? No, the XBB is so infectious that even if you are fully vaccinated, most people will get it. And I've heard many experts say it's not a matter of if you'll get XBB, but when. Mm. So I think we can expect to see more overloaded hospitals, perhaps the people won't be as sick, but once again, it's a numbers game. So if you have many people sick at the same time, you're going to overwhelm the hospital system and you're going to have high rates of death. Already we're up to about 450 Americans dying a, a day again. Uh, I didn't think we'd get there again. But also when you think of it with, um, you know, more people getting infected, you know, both in North America and Europe, and also it's only a matter of time before XBB is in China, you have more chances for the virus to mutate, right. more chances for it to recombine with other viruses and become more lethal or be, to become even more infectious. So we really don't know, uh, you know, what's coming down the, the pike. And to uh, reinforce what Dr. Hazeltine said, the whole yeah. concept of the herd immunity, that really only applies to diseases like polio or smallpox, where you can only get it once and you have mm -hmm. lifelong immunity after that. That's not the case with flu or with COVID. You can get it any number of times. And right. so the herd immunity really is not helpful here.
Calvin, very quickly, I've only got about a minute left. Um, you know, you were talking earlier on about investment in fighting this uh, virus outbreak. Uh, President Biden sought out 88 billion, just over 88 billion dollars, to build up biodefense and uh, pandemic preparedness, and he wanted another 9.25 billion to fund new vaccines and therapeutics. But none of this got any traction in Congress. Um, is that just short-sightedness? Uh, it's the wonderful world of checks and balances. That's what our American government is built on. You saw in the news on C-SPAN became the new, you know, CNN, Fox News, uh, the, the level of, you know, all that work being done to, for some parliamentary decision to elect the Speaker of the House, otherwise they can't get any work done. When was the last time they put all that effort into investing and working on making sure the nursing strikes don't happen, that I don't have to have to go to work wor worrying that I'm going to be understaffed or be overwhelmed or get sick. Um, I, don't, I wish I had a world that I didn't have to write a book about how de devastating COVID was to, the, to our city. But it also brings us hope that, you know, that even despite not having all those things, we always rise to the occasion. We live in New York City. We're very responsive yep. to things that bring us down and we always work together. So we've been through this already the past three years. We're still standing and we're still going strong. And I, I have hope that uh, things will turn around and for the better, and we'll be doing this again next year, talking about what more could have been done right. to prevent a triple, quadruple debit. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Calvin Sun, Yanir Bayam, Kate Talenko, thanks to all of you for being with us. Western media criticized China's policies regarding COVID and have embarked on a campaign to politicize the outbreak. To talk about this, let's bring in Brian Becker. He is the executive director of the Answer Coalition. Brian, great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks so much. So right now, Brian, we're faced with a global health crisis. But if you look at the Western media, especially the media in the United States, uh, they're using this crisis to smear China and to try and demonize the Chinese people. Nothing, it seems, that China does to combat the spread of this virus is acceptable to the West. Uh, you know, for months, the West has been slamming China's zero COVID policy. And now when China eases restrictions, there's more criticism on that very act. Um, what do you think is the motive behind these actions by the West against China? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, China is damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. Uh, one of the things, one of the great ironies about this story, about the U.S. media coverage, which is constantly demeaning and demonizing China about COVID, is that China's record is such a huge success, such a magnificent success. If China had followed uh, U.S. policy on COVID, the estimate is about 4.8 million Chinese people would have died. Uh, instead of many thousands, it would be many, many millions of Chinese people would have died. And the question is, why? Why is the U.S. media so hostile? And I think we have to go back to the framework here. There has emerged in the United States, unfortunately, tragically, regrettably, in the last few years, a, a consensus position within foreign policy elites, and it's manifested and reflected in the media, the mainstream media, which functions as more or less an echo chamber for this new consensus position, that the U.S. must view China only as an adversary, only as an enemy, and even possibly a military enemy in the future, rather than looking towards uh, the possibility of cooperation with China. So once this sort of mantra, this narrative that China is to be feared or to be hated uh, has taken hold as a consensus position within the U.S. establishment, then any voice that says, well, look, China's really made great progress on COVID, then they're considered to be weak on China. So we have this kind of Cold War mentality where China is witch-hunted, demonized, and it creates herd thinking within the United States. It's very, very unfortunate. And it's not just opinion that we're talking about here. I mean, there's some actions that have been taken as well. The United States now requires negative COVID tests from visitors from China to this country. And, of course, the United Kingdom dutifully followed the American uh, position as well. Uh, Japan, Spain, Italy have got these restrictions in place as well. But if you listen to the scientists, and there was the chief medical officer of the United Kingdom who said these restrictions are not effective. They don't do anything to prevent the spread of COVID. So it's purely a political move on the part of the United States and its allies, isn't it? It is purely politics. And when, when one thinks of it, 
Donald Trump called it the, the China virus, uh, the politicizing of a virus, which is something that all humans, regardless of ethnicity or nationality, are subject to, to say this is a Chinese virus, this is the Chinese problem, and now it's Chinese visitors are the problem. Where here we have, uh, in the United States, such a patchwork of sort of irrational COVID policies. If you go in one state uh, in, the, in, the, in 2021, you were required to wear a mask. If you went to Florida, a nearby state, it would be illegal to have a mandatory mask policy. Uh, we had people, we had companies actually destroying uh, protective masks in 2021 because they thought COVID, the COVID phenomena was going to go away and it was no longer good business. I mean, this patchwork of irrational, non-organized, non-centralized policies has led to an unmitigated disaster for Americans, 1.1 million dead. And remember, in 2020, 60 million people lost their jobs, 100,000 small businesses went bankrupt in a few months. And then here the U.S. is saying, look, and the U.S. media reflecting this position that everything China does, whether it has zero COVID, dynamic zero COVID, in spite of the fact that it's increased its life expectancy at the time of COVID, while the U.S. life expectancy has gone down and is, in fact, lower now than China's, all of these objective uh, facts are thrown out the window because of the animus and hostility that apparently is a requirement for the U.S. media when it covers uh, China. And if we look at you know, some of the opinions on, on the economy, on the world economy, there was a headline in The Economist, which is certainly no friend of China, but The Economist had this headline which said, China's reopening will disrupt the world economy. And it's this very same newspaper, as well as other Western newspapers, which has been calling for China's reopening. Indeed, this is, there's no logic, there's no rhyme or reason to the media reports. I mean, when China was, was locked down in Wuhan and stopping the spread of COVID and saving hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives, that was called a dictatorial authoritarian government. When China has a relaxation of those policies, that's considered to be sort of a reckless, provocative endangerment, not only of people's lives, of the world economy. I mean, truly, China cannot do anything, either uh, with restrictions or opening or easing restrictions, which are not condemned by the Western media, meaning the problem really isn't China's policy. It's the problem really is the orientation of the, of the Western and especially the U.S. mass media which is not telling the truth. It's creating a hysterical sense about China. And instead of people actually understanding what China's doing, trying to manage a healthcare crisis in a responsible way, a way that saves lives, and now in a way that allows the entire Chinese economy, which is such a dynamic and perhaps the most dynamic part of the world economy, to become completely robust again, that too is being condemned. Again, uh, this is a kind of policy that only feeds into anger, hatred, fear against China, rather than cooperation, which is what the world actually needs. Brian Becker, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.